Hi everyone, it's Father Eric. I just finished watching the movie Father Stew starring Mark Wahlberg and Mel Gibson, and I just wanted to film a quick review of the thing while things are kind of fresh in my mind. So as per usual, a major spoiler alert. So in terms of the basic plot, Mark Wahlberg plays Stuart Long, this guy who begins the movie more or less as an amateur boxer before developing aspirations to become an actor in Hollywood. And so he moves to Hollywood, he starts working as a local butcher to kind of pay the bills between gigs. And over the course of his work, he notices this young girl. And he quickly finds out that this girl is a regular volunteer at the local Catholic church. As a result of which he goes to this church, he starts checking out their activities, starts checking out her, and starts to kind of get involved. But then he finds out that an important prerequisite to actually dating her is that he actually needs to become baptized as a, as a Catholic, right? And so he does, right? He joins the RCIA, he takes the uh, requisite formation programs to become a Catholic, and he actually becomes a Catholic. But then what happens after dating this girl for a while, he gets in an accident, right? And so as a result of this near-death experience, he's, he's open to the grace of the Holy Spirit, and he discerns that he's called to the Holy Priesthood. Initially, he's rejected from the seminary because he's a little kind of rough around the edges, but then eventually he is accepted. But even after being accepted in the seminary, he faces even greater challenges. And the greatest challenge in a certain sense is this muscular disease, which eventually takes away his ability to walk and results in the compromised use of his hands. And at first, the Archdiocese basically kicks him out of the seminary because they think that his physical limitations will prevent him from celebrating the sacraments, especially the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But then before the movie's over, we find out that his local parish basically petitions the Archdiocese, which in turn allows him to get ordained, and so he's ordained a priest before the movie finally ends. Okay, so that's kind of a quick summary with regards to the basic plot of the film, but now I want to kind of focus on certain key themes in the film which sort of struck me as I was kind of watching the thing. So I guess the first thing that comes to mind is that when it comes to our dealings with other people, whether we're talking about a one-off conversation or an ongoing relationship, an important prerequisite to actually making those interactions fruitful and grace-filled is to learn to see other people as God sees them. In other words, our desire for people shouldn't be limited simply to their salvation or their redemption, but instead we should desire for them to become the persons that God is calling them to be, which is basically to say we should desire for them to become great, to become powerful conduits of God's grace for the world. And of course, that's precisely what we see in the course of the film, right? And so a running joke that we find up and down the film is this idea that a lot of people look at Stuart Long and they think to themselves, well, there's no way this guy would be called to the Holy Priesthood, right? Because what, he's an amateur boxer, he was incarcerated for a time, um, he's kind of like, you know, outspoken and a little rough around the edges. So there's no way, again, he could be called to be a Holy Catholic priest, except that he is and he was, right? And that's the point. We need to learn to look beyond the surface and see things as God sees them, to learn to see, again, the seeds of greatness when it comes to other people, regardless of outward appearance. And in the context of the movie, this comes through in the particular way that Stuart Long discerns his vocations as a priesthood. And so certainly a, a big part, perhaps arguably the, the main part of his discernment or vocation story is the accident, right? So the accident kind of opens up his heart, it breaks open his heart and makes him more humble and docile and open to the grace of conversion, the grace of discernment. But at the same time, another really key interaction helps to propel him forward in terms of discerning his vocation. And that's basically a really important confession that he has with his local priest. And so as a matter of background, what leads Stuart to go to confession is that he's guilty of premarital sex. In particular, he's taken away the virginity of his longtime girlfriend, right? But what's interesting is that in the context of the sacrament confession, the priest doesn't focus on the sin, but he focuses on Stuart's future. He focuses on who he could be as a result of receiving the grace of not just forgiveness, but the grace of conversion in the aftermath of his sin, right? And so basically he focuses on, the, on Stuart's potential to become again a powerful conduit of grace for the world. And the fact that this priest believes in him in the midst of his weakness, in the midst of his sin, propels again Stuart Long forward to become a holy Catholic priest. And of course, the takeaway message is that the same dynamic is supposed to play out in our own dealings with other people, right? And so the challenge is basically this. When I encounter my neighbor in his or her weakness or brokenness, or perhaps in the aftermath even of his or her sin, 
do I recognize that the seeds of greatness are still planted deeply in this person's heart? And more to the point, that these seeds can still be realized. This person still has dignity. This person still has value. This person still has a tremendous future because of God's grace, quite apart from their sin, their weakness, their brokenness. Again, that's a really important prerequisite to any sort of help I might offer to this person I might call my brother or sister in Christ. Okay, so that's kind of the first broad theme that kind of came to mind as I was watching the film. But the other thing that kind of came to mind as I was watching the movie was this notion that we need more Stuart Longs in this world. And we're to the point the world desperately needs sinners who have been dramatically transformed and changed and moved by the grace of God's conversion. And so again, when you look at the movie, when Stuart proposes to the people in his life that he's called to the priesthood, they all kind of reject it in some way, right? So his girlfriend thinks that he's insane. His mother thinks he's proposing this notion of the priesthood for Halloween. And even the rector of the seminary, he thinks that if he became a priest, he would be a scandal to the diocese and to the church at large. But then in response, Stuart Long points out to the rector and by extension to the world, quite correctly, I might add, that a lot of the great saints in our Catholic tradition used to be terrible sinners. And so, for example, think about Peter coming out to servants here, or think about St. Augustine basically fornicating, or think about St. Paul going around the countryside killing Christians, right? All these men, in a certain sense, were terrible sinners, but at the same time, they also had tremendous passion and therefore great potential to be powerful conduits of God's grace for the world. And so in a certain sense, all they needed was a little focus, a little direction, a few people to just believe in them, to believe that they too could become great. And of course, this reality of Stuart Long being this really powerful conduit of God's grace really plays out multiple times in the context of the film. And for my money, one of the most powerful scenes takes place in the context of a prison. And so as a matter of background, Stuart at this point in the movie, he's still a seminarian. And he and a fellow seminarian, they go to this, again, prison to minister to the people there. And so as you might imagine, a lot of them are kind of sitting there, they're, they're kind of skeptical and cynical. And these seminarians are, are putting themselves in a position to, to try to help these people from a spiritual perspective. And so first of all, the seminarian who's not Stuart Long, he begins to speak, right? And so he begins by basically giving empty platitudes, right? And so he says, you know, Christ calls us to encounter people in the midst of their darkness, right? As a result of which he's met with bitterness and, and scorn, at which point Stuart Long steps in. And so what Stuart does is kind of brilliant, actually. He begins by establishing a relationship. You know, so he asks the, the prisoners collectively, how often do you, you get to make a phone call, right? In response to which it's like, you know, once a week, if that. And so Stuart goes on to say, well, okay, you have the ability to call people once a week, but you know, basically who are you gonna call, right? And his point is that a lot of people in, in their past lives, um, maybe they don't want anything to do with them anymore because now they're in prison, right? And he goes on to say that, okay, even though that might be the case, God is always available. God is always available to talk to. You don't need to ask for permission. You can always call him, if you will, in the context of prayer. And he's always willing to listen, right? And on top of that, he says, you know, God still believes in you. And so, yeah, maybe there's this thing that you did, which has resulted in you uh, entering into prison, but God still believes in you. So don't give up on God. And more to the point, don't give up on yourself. But in any case, the underlying point is that the only reason why Stu is able to meet these prisoners in the messiness of their own reality is that because he knows what it means to be a sinner who's been redeemed, a sinner who's been converted. And again, more to the point, the idea is that the world desperately needs people like that, sinners who have been moved and changed and transformed by the grace of God. But that brings us to the final point I want to make here, namely this notion of human suffering, and in particular God's response to the reality of human suffering. Because of course the theme of human suffering is in a certain sense the predominant theme when it comes to this particular movie. I mean, think about the various ways in which Stuart Long actually suffers throughout the course of this movie. I mean, think, for example, about the car accident. Think about how he's initially rejected from the seminary. Think about how he's eventually kicked out from the seminary before he can get ordained, right? So all sorts of different ways in which he suffers, which obviously begs the question, what's Christ's response to this? Well, whenever I think about this particular subject, I always think about this really great apostolic letter written by John Paul II, basically entitled On the Christian Meaning of Human Suffering. And so basically, just to kind of paraphrase, Near the end of this letter, John Paul II says that whenever we pose to God the Father the question, why am I suffering? The first thing we notice is that Christ the Son is also suffering on the cross. 
But then more to the point, he goes on to say that God the Father will never give us an intellectual response to that question. Again, why am I suffering? But instead, he'll respond in a certain sense with an invitation to actually enter into the dynamics of our own personal suffering and to discover the answer by going through that particular vocation, if you will. You see, what's interesting is that John Paul II adds on top of that, that even when you embrace your suffering as a calling, and again, as a vocation, at the end of that process, you still won't receive an intellectual answer to the question, why am I suffering? But instead, you'll realize in retrospect that the answer actually comes to you in terms of your own personal transformation, a transformation which can only come about through the reality of human suffering. And of course, that's precisely what we see in the context in the movie, right? And so even though Stuart cries out to the Lord over and over again, why are you allowing this? Why am I suffering in this way? You'll notice that God never actually gives Stuart an intellectual response to the question, why am I suffering, right? But instead, it's revealed by his own, again, transformation. And so from my perspective watching the film, even though there are obviously moments in the movie where Stuart feels like the Lord has abandoned him by allowing him to, to suffer in these various ways, the reality is actually quite different. Because the reality is that through this prolonged experience of intense suffering, Stuart Long is actually transformed to actually become another Christ in this world. And that's precisely what you see playing out near the end of the film, precisely in this relational dynamic between Stuart and his parents, his father being played by Mel Gibson. And so basically in the aftermath of being kicked off from the seminary, his parents, who were formerly estranged earlier on in the film, they, they come together to help their son through this difficult moment. And there's this really powerful scene where Stuart falls in, in the bathroom. And the Mel Gibson character, his father, comes in and helps him up. And it's really evident in that moment that he's not just helping his son, but he's actually helping the wounded and suffering Christ. And the movie strongly implies that because of these repeated encounters with the wounded and crucified Christ, both Stuart's father and his mother are completely transformed. And so before the end of the movie, you see the mother and father reconcile, whereas before the relationship was really tense. And then on top of that, you see the Mel Gibson character repenting before finally entering into the Holy Catholic Church. Okay, now I realize there's kind of a lot going on here, but perhaps I might leave you with one final thought. And so as I'm recording this, it's a weekday. And so I saw this movie in the context of a weekday matinee. And so besides myself, there were maybe like three or four other people. And from my understanding, the movie isn't really getting a lot of really good reviews, which is actually kind of typical for movies with overtly Christian themes. But you know, that said, the thought that kept on coming to mind as I was watching this film was that even though a lot of people might not like it, and even though a lot of people might not even see it, the people that do, there's real potential for their hearts to be moved, for their hearts to be completely transformed, especially if you're thinking about a vocation to the priesthood and religious life. Because, you know, quite honestly, I think this movie does a really powerful job of showing what the gospel in a certain sense does best pulling sinners out of the muck, pulling sinners out of the pits, and transforming them into really tremendous and great people. Real powerful, again, conduits of God's grace. Because, you know, I think quite honestly, there's going to be a lot of people who see this movie and then think to themselves in the aftermath of having seen this film, I guess there's hope. I guess there's hope for me after all. Hope for me to be forgiven. Hope for me to be reconciled with the Father. Who knows? Hope for me to be a saint. And if that's the only takeaway message you have after seeing this movie, that's a pretty good takeaway message. And what's more, it's true. And may God bless you all.